again, we greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Those of you who are worshiping here at 1228 West Apache, and those of you who are worshiping with us via our streaming ministry, I invite your attention to the New Testament book of Acts. That is the Acts of the Apostles, and we'll be reading from the ninth chapter. In fact, it's Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. And as you find that, if you're really quick about it, go ahead and put your finger in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah chapter 13. There's a short verse or just a part of a verse that I want to share uh, with you as well to give some context and add flavor to the sermon title and, and our topic today. Over the next two Sundays, I want to close out our Changes sermon series. So uh, today will be part one of two sermons, and next week we will close out the series that we have called Changes. And um, we're going to actually take kind of a different direction uh, with uh, respect to how we look at the concept of change. So are you ready for the word? Listen for the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. I want to talk today from the title, Can a Leopard Change Its Spots? Can a Leopard Change Its Spots? Somebody's already preaching my sermon out there. I heard you. I heard you. I heard you. You already at the punchline. God bless you. Yeah, listen. My grandmother, my grandmother had a bad habit, a bad habit of opening our home to anybody, anybody, everybody who found themselves down on their luck. That was just her way. If you were evicted from your apartment, even if the eviction was your fault because you had not paid the rent, if you were evicted from your apartment and nobody else would take you in, uh, probably because you had already burned bridges with everybody else that, who had taken you in before. My grandmother, Sister Cora Lee Mack, she'd be the one to, to take you in. You didn't have to be a blood relative. You could just be a neighbor. My grandmother would always offer our home. If you got caught, watch this, stepping out on your spouse and your spouse put you out. Sister Mac, my, my grandmother, she would still take you in. Now, let me be clear. She would talk you to death. She would quote scriptures over you even while you were sleeping, talking about, baby, don't you know the wages of sin is death? 
Yeah, she would keep on going and speak the word over you, but she would give you a place to lay your head at night. If you were hiding from the police because you had committed a crime in some other city or a state and nobody else wanted anything to do you with you, guess what? My grandmother, she would say, come on in, baby. We got a place for you to stay. She would take you in uh, uh, with your law uh, list self, right? And even if you were a victim, a victim of domestic violence and you needed a safe space to stay, even if you had two and three children, Cora Lee Mack, she would be the one to take you in. So, so, so at any given time, at any given time, and I told y'all we didn't have a whole lot of money, so we didn't have a, a whole lot of house, but one little house we had, she would take in anybody who needed a place to stay. So that at any given time, there would be random family members or, or, or friends of the family or, or those people you call play cousins, right? Anybody got some play cousins? Over the years, though, over the years, <laughs> however, there were two transient souls who frequented our home and found their rest on my big mama's plastic-covered pleather sofa. They were big mama's sister's son and daughter. And though technically they would be my cousins, second cousins, I guess, to be exact, but because they were good and grown, we called them Uncle Bill and Aunt Lonnie. You know, we weren't very bougie. We didn't use aunt. We said Aunt Lonnie. Aunt Tootsie's girl, Lonnie, right? Aunt Lonnie and Uncle Bill. So, you know, I grew up in a time where when you were a child, your mama, your grandmama, your daddy would tell you when you are speaking to an, an adult, you got to put a, a handle on it. So they had to be aunt or uncle or mister or pastor or something. So we put the handle uncle for Bill, my cousin, and aunt for Lonnie, uh, my other cousin. Both were two of the most happy, go lucky people in the world. They didn't seem to have one care in the world. One of them would just show up drunk as a skunk. Big Mama would make them go uh, in the bathroom and get cleaned up for dinner. Then she would fry some chicken and fix some cornbread and cook up some brown beans and call everybody to the kitchen table. Before dinner was over, one of us kids would undoubtedly ask that elephant in the room question. Huh? We look at uh, Uncle Bill and say, uh, Uncle Bill, so how long are you staying um, this time? And my grandmother would always give us that mind your own business stare. And so the question never really got answered because Bill always stayed as long as he wanted to stay until he got a new job or some money or, or a new woman or something that allowed him to move out and strike out on his own again. And when dinner was done that night, Bill would go in his bag, he would pull out his bottle, go sit out on the back porch, get drunk, come back in the house, pass out on the plastic covered sofa. For years, for years, my Uncle Bill and his sister, Aunt Lonnie, relied on my grandmother's sofa as their safe place to recover from their drunken stupors or from their tenuous lifestyle, the lifestyle that they had chosen for themselves. For years, my family and our friends warned my grandmother, admonished my grandmother that she was doing nothing more than enabling their heinous habits. Yet she refused to hear any of that talk because she fundamentally believed that one day they will change. I remember over here my grandmother arguing with her best friend about this issue. Her best friend, whom we call Aunt Beth. Now, she wasn't really an auntie, Sister Kathy. You know how that goes. Aunt Beth wasn't even a family member, but she was grown. So we call her 
Aunt Beth. And I remember one time hearing my grandmother uh, fussing uh, with uh, Aunt Beth about uh, the fact that my grandmother was allowing these uh, grown folk to live in her house and eat up her food and, and suck up her air and watch her TV and sleep on her good sofa and then stay drunk all day long. My grandmother, my grandmother, she responded uh, saying, Beth, these are my late sisters and uh, children. I can't put them out in the streets. And besides, my mama said, the Lord ain't through with them yet. And she believed that. She said, the Lord ain't, ain't through with them yet. And since Big Mama went all churchy on uh, Aunt Beth, and she clapped back with the word of God as well to make her point. She said, the Bible says a leopard can't change its spots, Cora. And with, uh, with that, she accented her belief that because they had been lying, cheating, stealing, lazy, uh, drunks all their lives, they were always going to be lying, stealing, cheating, lazy, drunks. But that only made my big mama even more angry and rooted in her resolve. And she said to her, oh, Beth, I know, yes, a leopard can't change its stripes. But just what somebody in section two said just a minute ago, God can. <laughs> That's what she said. A leopard can't change its stripes, but God can. And then with a firmness in her voice, she demanded, ain't nobody my God can't change. That's what she said. She said, ain't nobody in this world that my God, she believed that thing. And, and even though my grandmother never, ever went to seminary, in fact, she had just a sixth grade education, she knew what she was talking about when she said, ain't nobody, my God, can't change. Her grammar may have been bad, but her theology is real good. For that is exactly what the writer of uh, Acts, Luke, seems to be saying in the passage under our consideration today. Ain't nobody, my God, can't change.